Good. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Jan, uh, for you. coming. Jan, I can I can get away with saying this. Jan, I, I taught uh, with Jan for ten years. with senior associate dean with Jan. Jan's one of the great professors at Harvard Business School and in this country, and is uh, is a great leader. So we went months ago to see if we could convince him to come down. And so we're thrilled that you're here in Dallas. The group knows you exaggerate a lot, right? No, <laughs> not on this. I don't. Uh, let me just ask a question. I always like to, how many are here at the Dallas Fed for the first time? All right, so that's good. That's good. So as for those who are coming for the first time tonight, welcome. For those who've been here uh, before, please, we're, we're thrilled that you're back. Uh, we, our philosophy at the Dallas Fed and the reason we do programs like this is we want to encourage the public uh, to come to the Fed. This is your place. We are in a unique institution where we're quasi-government related, but we're also uh, owned by the private sector, banks, and we are we are we are here to serve this district. And the fact that uh, that you are here is critical to us. And I would say, if you enjoy what you see tonight, bring other people and invite others to come. We want to invite the public and make this uh, a place that the public can come to learn. Not just about monetary policy, but economic conditions and can be on in the matter. So thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, so Jan, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll launch right in. Uh, you, you, Jan's a strategy professor, by the way. And I remember some number of years ago, uh, the dean of Harvard Business School asked Jan and Michael Porter, uh, to launch with other professors, uh, the U.S. Competitiveness Project. And, uh, the ultimate piece that Mark was referring to, was the most popular and most widely read Harvard Business School, uh, Harvard Business Review uh, ish edition in history. Um, and Jan has been spending the last number of years working intensively on this project, but still being a strategy professor. And so let's start with, why'd you do this project? Why does the U.S. Competitiveness Project start? Yeah, great. So first of all, can I, can I just say a word of gratitude first? Sure. To you, Rob, we miss you at And thank you all for coming out. I really, um, you're playing because you sold away from us. So you're very, very fortunate. Um, okay, and thank you all for coming out. I'm looking forward to, to the conversation with you and also just learning about Dallas. I'm fascinated by So the Competitive Project, you know, what, what is it? It's eight. This is a platform, basically, a platform for faculty to conduct research and disseminate findings on a particular question. The question was, um, what can leaders, especially business leaders, do to boost U.S. competitiveness? And I really do need a platform. We've had about 20 faculty involved over, 20, over six years now. And you know uh, my colleagues, they don't take direction very well. So it's not about anyone saying, this is what thou shalt study. It's a platform for faculty who are interested in these topics to collaborate and have some synergy. Okay. And so one of the things that's interesting about this project is the definition of competitiveness. Yeah. And I actually, at the time when you first defined it, uh, you know, it made, made me stop and say, wow, that's a different kind of definition. So just for the audience here, yeah. how do you define competitiveness? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting point. I, I got to tell you, when we started the project, we spent a lot of time Arguing is only faculty can argue over a definition, right? <laughs> and and, and I, I, actually, I thought it wasn't a very useful conversation. I thought we'd just make a decision and move forward. And my co my co chair, Michael Porter, said, No, no, this is one of the most important things we're going to do. And darn it, he was right again. Um, so we define competitors as follows The U.S. is competitive to the extent that firms operating in the U.S. can do two things win in the global marketplace, that's fairly clear but also lift the living standards of the average American. And you often hear the second part of the definition forgotten. So people will say things like, boy, the U.S. would be more competitive if only wages here were lower. Well, that would make it easier for firms to compete from the U.S. It would not lift living standards. So what we're essentially saying is we've got to have both aid. And if we have to lower our wages to sell goods, if we have to take a national pay cut to sell our goods abroad, that's not a sign we're competitive. That's a sign we are not competitive. So we very system on both so, aspects. So by that definition, what is your verdict or judgment on not only the state of U.S. competitiveness, but the trend over the last 10, 15 years? So, I, I, you know, the two parts of the definition are actually quite telling. My summary of being, we've got an economy that's doing half its job. So we've got quite successful firms 
Uh, we have got large companies and those who run and invest in them doing quite well. And meanwhile, we've got working and middle class Americans who are deeply struggling, as are many small businesses. Uh, we've actually surveyed our loans on the trajectory, asking about do, do you expect in three years' time for firms to be able to support higher wages and living standards? Do you think that they'll be more able to succeed in the whole marketplace? And the alums tell us by about 50% to 30% no, 20% is no, right? 50% would say, the trajectory, the trajectory of U.S. competitors is down to the current. Okay. And you talk a lot about the term the commons. Yeah. So yeah. our company's making money. We know corporate profits are record highs, but then you say you analyze the commons. You might explain what that is and how is the commons fairing? Sure, sure. So but when you look at that definition, the only way you can succeed in having companies that prosper, satisfy their customers, satisfy their shareholders, and also pay workers well, is they've got to be extraordinarily good at turning inputs and value out. You've got to be highly productive. And any community, any citizen, any company relies on certain shared resources in order for the work to be productive. Um, we're talking about things like every company needs an educated populace. It needs a, a strong base of workforce skills and a system for developing these skills over time. You've got to have strong infrastructure. You've got to have some basic R&D. And um, particularly working with class Americans tend to thrive or struggle, depending on whether the commons on which they're drawn is strong or not. I think you're systematically underinvested. So how, how does growing wealth inequality and income in the United States fit in with this definition? Yeah, so, so we actually, I, 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 I have intended to shy away from the term inequality and focus more on shared prosperity. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Uh, inequality is inherently a relative term. And I can reduce inequality tomorrow by doing the following. I can take money from very rich people and burn it. Okay. That reduces inequality. <laughs> I'm not suggesting it, don't worry, I'm not suggesting it. <laughs> but I'm much more worried about it. I think what most Americans can buy into is yeah. are the boats all rising together? Right. Do we have a situation in which rich Americans, middle class Americans, working class Americans, poor Americans, the, 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 they're, they're, they're struggling together or thriving together, perfectly thriving together, right. obviously. It's a much more. What do you find? And what do you find? So, you know, <clears throat> what we're finding is we just lack shared prosperity in the country. We've got. Um, you know, a set of individuals, including many of whom I adore and I teach and so forth, who have globally uh, marketable skills that can be leveraged by technology, who are thriving. And it's a golden age for them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that is a, uh, a minority, and we have got many people who can't draw any from the comments to be highly productive. And I think as a consequence, you see lots of bad things happen. And for me, particularly, a democracy without shared prosperity is a very fragile thing. And let me go a little deeper because we talk yeah. a lot about this here at the Fed, and you and I talk a lot about this. How does this shared prosperity vary by educational standards? People who've graduated high uh, college and people who have high school and less education. How does it shake out? So I know clearly you've got <coughs> greater prosperity the higher end of the skills spectrum. Though actually, there's been a really interesting shift. Uh, over, say, the periods 1979 to 2000, 2000 to, to today. Uh, if you look at the data on real wage growth by educational attainment yeah. in the 79 through 2000 uh, period, what you see is that as you've got greater education, the rate of growth is, is greater, and you need some college to stay, you know, basically keep pace with inflation. If you look 2000 onward, uh, first of all, the hardest place to be is just having some college education. Yeah. Um, the um, folks with the least education are not doing very well, but actually a little better in terms of real wage growth. I think part of what's driving that is they've got jobs that are not being replaced quickly by technology, and they're hard to be outsourced. And then you've got folks with advanced degrees doing this burden very well. Yeah. So the folks in the middle, and so we, we also talk, the we talk a lot here that a third of new jobs in this country are high skilled. 20%, 22% are low skill, and 45% we call middle skills, except those middle skills jobs require a lot more training, uh, and we're not keeping up. Yeah. And I think we're also in some middle skills uh, uh, area is precarious, right? Uh, a lot of folks in those areas have had, uh, or been in industries, particularly manufacturing industries, yes, where automation and globalization has squeezed them. 
uh, I think the rhetoric is taking place globalization, the data I see shows it's much more technology automation. So let's flesh that out a little bit, because yeah, you yeah. probably heard me, we've talked about it. A lot of these deals uh, are being today attributed to globalization are much more likely, you might flesh this yeah. out more, are much more likely technology sure, sure. and disruption. You might explain I that. don't want to discount globalization. There's certainly evidence that globalization, particularly entry of China into the world economy, I mm-hmm. displace manufacturing workers to the tune of one or two million. And they're over capacity. Um, and over capacity. I said, I don't want to displace it. But, but um, I think that when you look, when you dive into the data, the number of jobs displaced by technological change, particularly automation, uh, compared to that by globalization, is about five or six to one. Wow. That said, the rhetoric politically is toward globalization and my uh, ungenerous attribution is it is much easier for people to say, your job, it does exist. It exists somewhere in China. It, there's someone who has that job, and by the way, it's someone who doesn't look like you. Uh, then to say, you know, technology has made it harder, and we've got to, you know, find a way to reskill and, and last uh, uh, question. Does it vary dramatically, the shared prosperity, by rural area versus cities or by geographic areas of the country? Yeah, so for sure there is wide variation, even wide variation across cities. The point two things. First of all, rural areas very heavily, you know, hardly hit. And but also inner city areas. And in many ways, those areas are, are similar. i got to tell you, I think two weeks ago, I went to Golden Triangle, Mississippi, uh, which is in the northeastern part of the city. So one of the poorest areas of the poorest state in the union. And um, they, they managed to take a generation-long downward economic spiral and turn it into advanced manufacturing group. So we took about 20 faculty just to go and see how they do it, right? And we were making, we were kind of taking away our lessons in the airport and the way home. And the dominant, less, dominant lesson was actually the urban problems and the rural problems are remarkably similar. Yeah. around education, around workforce, around getting the community to actually work together across sectoral boundaries. Um, remarkably so. The other thing I would note, city by city, there's there are dramatic differences. So um, my colleague Raj Shed and Nate Hendrick uh, in the Harvard Econ Department, now, now Raj is at Stanford, did this fascinating study looking at economic mobility by city. So if you're born poor, what are the odds you will you'll be able to rise to the ranks uh, in the income distribution. It turns out that cities differ dramatically. So if you are born poor in Salt Lake City, you've got a pretty good shot. Uh, if you're born poor in Charlotte, North Carolina, God help you. So some cities have, have figured this out. And this has to do with investment in the commons, infrastructure, education, or what, what's your take so, on that? So the research is very careful, and there are correlations, not of kinds of causation. Um, for sure, there is correlation with the quality of the educational system. Correct. Okay. Right? There, there's also, um, there is correlation, uh, there's some interesting correlations and, and things. So, for instance, they find um, that there, there, there are racial differences with African Americans having lower mobility, but actually, once you control for um, um, family structure, the racial differences just about disappear. Uh, the family structure impacts are not simply in your household, but also in your neighborhood. So a child born in a single family household in a neighborhood with lots of two parent households uh, does is, has much higher mobility mm. on average than one who's in a neighborhood with single parent households. These are all just suggested. We, we don't know the causation patterns, but I think the correlation patterns are at least does ask better questions. All right, so out of all the work that you've done, you've come up with a number of recommendations. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you just to summarize your most important recommendations that we'll talk about. Sure. So, so let me um, break this down in a little ways. And just so you've got the context, the underlying um, the underlying diagnosis is that of systematic underinvestment in comments. So whatever happens from here in terms of prescription had better hit that diagnosis or something wrong in the logic, right? Uh, I'll tell you mine, and then I should also say that we've had 20 faculty involved with myself, not, you know, I have a debt to my colleagues, but I never speak on their behalf. So, um, let me break it down federal and local, first of all. We're familiar with that way of operating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so the first thing I would say at the federal level, and so 
I can guarantee you that no Nobel Prize will be awarded for the following observation. Um, the legislative system in the federal government is still in America. Um, and and uh, so, so early on, we were naive. We were totally naive. Our focus was on what can business do, but inevitably you can look some opinions on what about the role of business, the role of government. So we came up with a list of things that we thought were no brainers. Um, we were quickly told no brainer is not the term to use. Um, but yeah, things like um, deeper infrastructure investment, a time of underemployed construction workers, the lowest interest rates we'll ever see, right, right. and crumbling infrastructure. Why don't we have you know, investments? Um, high school immigration. This one drives me nuts. We attract the best and brightest to our country. And then they, they they graduate. They want to stay here and build businesses and build lives. And we say, no, no, go home and compete with us. Right. I was going to make a recommendation on that. There's literally, I remember you suggested every graduate degree in engineering degree stamp a birthday yeah. immigrant card. That yeah. was a shorthand my, way yeah, of saying it. My colleagues who are better at this, like Bill Kerr is a colleague who's yeah. done a lot in high school. What's he saying? He says that's probably a little naive. At least he's a little more selective than that. Okay. But he also shares with me stunning. Stunning data. So one fact I just got throughout this one, you can't hear in the last week. It turns out that China, you look at like innovation patents, patent patents, it turns out that Chinese and Indian immigrants in the Bay Area collectively last year had counted for more patents than the 28 least inventive states. The 28 least invented states were out invented, out patented by two. Sets of and, that's in one area. and that's consistent with right. work we do on, uh, yeah. on innovation. So let's send it back, right? Let's yeah. So let's <laughs> 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 so structure so we, so we, so we, so right? Sustainable federal budget, a corporate tax reform. You know, okay, let's stay with that given it's in the news. Yeah, 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 I yeah, may yeah. have observed. Yep. Uh, corporate tax reform. Yeah. Uh, specifically, what was the recommendation? The recommendation, and let me be very clear this was a matter of policy direction. So it's not the low okay. granularity that the folks Sorry. in Washington deal with. But it was basically, look, um, lower the statutory rate, yeah. close the loopholes to make the revenue neutral, right. and get rid of a territorial system that encourages companies to keep uh, overseas profits abroad rather okay. than bring back on the right. So that, that's straightforward. But you know, look, we, we had this list, and, and we were careful. So we, and by the way, the reason for that recommendation yeah. is you thought that companies would therefore be more likely to locate here and invest in the commons if we change the tax code accordingly, right? You got it. Okay. And the infrastructure one directly on the on the tax code, the okay. high school immigrants, the the productive research in which all is build businesses, basically. Okay. So it's all about the commons. Okay. But you know, we, we surveyed our loans to figure out are these well accepted across the global spectrum? Yes. Then we surveyed the public. And across the global spectrum, most of them also got approval, a little a lot more oh, idle business. Well. Yeah. Uh, and the territorial tax one, the public wasn't was keen on. Yeah. But but then we went to Washington, expecting a partisan divide, and instead we found consensus. Right. They behind closed doors, they would say, "Yeah, these are the right things." And they would ask them to get done, and they'd say, "No, it's not going to happen." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so by the way, I remember I was at Harvard at the time. I would talk to Jan, and I talked to Michael Porter. And they had just come back from DC after their like the thirtieth trip. Yeah. And every meeting is an excellent meeting, but nothing was happening. And and so just for the audience, after enough of these, I remember we talked about it. You changed your strategy a bit. Well, so fairness to Mike, I changed my strategy. Mike persisted. Okay, I know he did. So in a different. But how did you change your strategy? I changed my strategy local. Mike said, "I'm going to fix the political system." Because Mike has no fear. Um, and we can come back to what he what yeah, his Mike analysis might be able to do it. Too. And, we'll and if anyone can do it, it we might. So what did you um, so that didn't get traction. Yeah. So what did so, get traction? So, so what I did what we did find, uh which I found incredibly encouraging, is at the local level, uh, there are a lot of leaders who have said, Look, we realize no one from Washington is going to come and help us. We better do it ourselves. And um what we see again and again is local cross-sector collaboration to restore the commons. And they local take things, form. mayors, local business people, it's, local junior colleges, you name it. It is mayors, it is business leaders, it is the leaders of educational Chamber of Commerce. Profits, it's the Chambers of Commerce, it's local civil alliances, uh, it's faith-based organizations, it's yeah. labor unions, yep. and they're doing things like the company that partners with community college trade the workers that don't hire. I can give you a specific example. Right. Like it's it's things like 
a simple line is figuring out what infrastructure do we really need to work on, or the university partnering with the local government and get ideas out of the research lab and getting the startups and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so right. good news there. All right, so you saw a lot of receptivity to these recommendations locally. So it's a different set of recommendations. It's they're not going to fix the whole text. And so what were the local said, recommendations? The local recommendations is about um, it is about partnering across sectoral lines to rebuild the commons. Because the problem with the commons is it's common, right? No individual sector is responsible. So you take workforce development, right? Right. Which I know is one you've got passion around. Yeah. So you know, look, you've got to have employers who know what skills are available or are, are needed. You've got to have uh, educational institutions who can actually deliver those skills. You've got to have would-be employees who are willing to make the, the investments. And you've got to have government as a convener where it doesn't happen. Because yeah. right now, I mean, the workforce system in the country is, I mean, it's, it's And we spent a lot of time on this. You're in that, I take it, uh, you focus also on improving educational attainment levels, early childhood literacy, college readiness. You got it. And all of those. So what you try to do is get businesses and nonprofits and leaders, civic leaders together. And I have to say, there's a single pattern in it. It's about um, tapping what talent exists in the population and aligning with opportunity. I mean, so here's a metaphor I use. So imagine two companies. It's one company. When they bring in new employees, they very carefully assess the talents of the employees and align their assignment with the talent. Right? There's another company that has a different talent system. When people come in. They're aligned, they're assigned a random number, okay? And then based on that random number, they're given a job, yeah. right? And so you wind up with salespeople, people with sales talent, working the production line, people with mechanical skills and sales, right? Yeah. The, second, the second firm, I think we all look at and say, it's crazy, right? But that's a pretty good approximation of what we do nationally right now with our with, with young people, right? People, when they're born, they're assigned a random number, it's called a zip code, and that dictates a lot of their opportunities. Okay, so you've gone out and been to count. I know you and the team have been to countless cities. Yeah. Done countless forums. Uh, in light of all this work, how are we doing now? Are we making progress, or has it been? Is it been? Is it still frustratingly slow? Or are we making progress? So if you name a city, I know I will be able to answer you. Okay. Right, because it varies a lot by city. Right. Um, oh, yes. Detroit's a fascinating life. Just. I've just written a case for it. Dallas. Dallas. Okay. Dallas. Yeah, let's, let's take. Let's take. Let's start with Detroit. Dallas. Okay. I mean, I, I, Dallas. I'm not. I, I just don't. I can give you. I give my two cents because I know our recommendations are. Okay. Uh, but but give us an example. What are the characteristics of the cities that did well with these recommendations and those where you struck out? You feel like we struck out. So we lost about the power of our, of our recommendations because many of these cities were making progress right. before that and right. we formed our recommendations. So of the cities that are making progress, what do they, yeah. what do they have in common? So, so um, there's actually, there are dramatic commonalities. The first thing is there is some sort of organization which is the convener. There is some place we know we go to make sense of what's happening and to try to make progress. So in Minneapolis, St. Paul, it's the Itasca Project Groups of civic leaders who have come together, actually have no formal funding, nothing. We just come together regularly. Yeah. Uh, the Columbus Partnership in Columbus, Ohio. Yep. Yeah. So you got to have a, you got to have a group of leaders. Uh, you got to have, I think, a broad voice from the community. Yeah. Uh, and that depends a little bit on what you're trying to get done. If you're trying to get economic development done. You can properly do it with, with just um, <coughs> most of the business leaders. Yeah. You try to affect public education. You try it with just the business leaders. Uh, you know, it's, it's a nightmare. So Columbus, Columbus Partnership tried doing this and uh, basically got their Perspective. head in hand on it, right? No, it's terrible. How important is the mayor? Um, uh, part of the team, but just part of the team. Right. Uh, typically, key leader in, in it. Um, the major issue there is continuity. If you've got a dominant mayor, so Columbus, Ohio, had a dominant mayor and been yeah. reelected by you know, 70 to 30 percent. So he could invest in long-term priorities, even things that were unpopular. He could, you know, put forward um, proposals to raise taxes, right. even in downturns. That helps. Without that, we've got a lot of. So, so you and I both have spent a lot of time in Detroit. Me with the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. What's your? What? You get, when you answer the question, how's it? Why don't you explain? Detroit obviously didn't do these things well, yeah. and then it started being them much better. What, what's the story in yeah. Detroit? So Detroit. Um, the first thing I think is, is remarkable about Detroit is the, why Detroit failed. 
And there are many parts of that story, including dependence on the single industry and the, the inability of the strategic leadership of that industry to see what was coming. But the key part of it was, on every dimension you could imagine, Detroit was a divided city. Racially, ethnically, management versus labor, city versus suburb, business versus government. So very and tough to come together. So no cross of collaboration. Right. Right. Um, and you know, it hit rock bottom. Um, and I think there is now a sense of hope and particularly investment in the downtown area. Yeah. Uh, Dan Gilbert's investment is the most striking, but I think he would be the first to say there were other business leaders who came and made similar things, the Illich family, uh, for instance, the Pesky uh, family. And uh, they have managed to do something remarkable downtown. Um, and the mayors and played a big role. The mayors played a, played a massive role. The foundations have played a massive so role. So Kresge, the, Ford, others. Yeah. And what you see them doing downtown is essentially securing the commons. It started with maybe the most basic thing, public safety. Yeah. I mean, Dan Gilbert's got a bunker yeah. where he's you know got security agents who are you know looking at the downtown area and assisting the police. Yeah. Um, and they are you know providing public spaces. I think the the key question on Detroit though is will the prosperity in the downtown area actually spread to the neighborhoods? Right. And the neighborhoods are still hard pressed. And when you wander around downtown. Um, Right now, still a lot of areas. See, too, yeah. wide areas and that's that kind of donut. Yeah. And what you see, are, you don't see individuals in the, the neighborhood, right? That they're not the ones who are getting the jobs and quick loans right now. Right. And I worry about what will happen when those individuals who are putting loans, you know, they're young folks, they're downtown, they love living downtown, yeah. they, you know, have kids and they start to ask them, what schools will these kids go to? Right. Um, they didn't fix that problem. So it's because they haven't built the ecosystem. They know. But I think they are addressing, though, is the, the connections across the community. I will make a little comment, and then we'll, yeah. I'm going to turn it. We're going to take, I've got a bunch more questions, but let's hear from the audience. But I'll, I'll mention on Dallas what I've learned yeah, with the background of having worked on this right. in other cities. But the good, the, one of the great things about Dallas is, I think, uh, public officials, nonprofits, business leaders uh, come together, I think, this is my view as an outsider, new here two years, come together, I think, very, very well right. and have a shared interest in doing analysis. And there's a number of groups, I'm thinking of Tom Luce and others, a number of others who do excellent analysis. People come together and are committed to working together to try to address these areas. That's on the positive side. Um, and it may be a The fact please. that people are making decisions based on data. I think that's a remarkably important pattern you see when it's successful for these, that's what it is, right? So, otherwise, it's a he said, she said. And, and so there's still, though, a stubbornly tough, you know, blinded areas not far from here where we haven't been able to yet build the ecosystem, and the mayor and other leaders here are very concerned about it. You've got uh, high levels of wealth inequality. You've got the highest number of insured in the state, not Dallas in the state. One of the things the state, though, and the city has going for it is we've got, and this is what helped hurt Detroit. Detroit was badly hurt by population out. Yeah, yeah. We've got the we've got people coming in where the population of the state's gone from twenty two and a half to in excess of twenty eight million. This city is growing. Houston is growing a lot of it, but this city in particular is growing, as is Austin and San Antonio. And I think you'll find it's a lot easier to come together to build the commons if you are going north. And this is one of the things we've talked about in the United States with an aging population and slowing workforce growth, that unless you're a big city like this and has the right ecosystem, yeah. uh, there's a war for people in this country and people are necessary to fund and come together to add the rocket fuel to a lot of these yeah. programs. The population part, I think that's key. I mean, in Detroit is a city of 700,000 in a landmass that was built for 1.8 million. Yeah. So in many ways, Detroit is distant from itself, yeah. right? It's the low critical And its city. peak what population was 1.8. It okay. was probably, okay. so it's a stunning loss of population. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. let me stop here, and I want to have plenty of time. Let's take questions from the audience, and I'll, I'll come back at the end later. And there's a microphone on the side. So if you can make your way, sorry about this, the microphones. And let's take let's take question right here. And make, we have you sort of go to the microphone. Sorry about that. 
Hey, John. <clears throat> my name is Dave Smith. I'm, uh, I spent my life in Manifest. And, um, you know, I watched the, uh, the closing of 50,000 factories. I, I came out of grad school. I worked for the largest manufacturing company in the world. It's simply. You know, and I guess a couple of elements that, that bother me is when I began, the CEOs of America made 300, 30 times the average wage. Now they make 300. And then since the Great Recession, which accelerated manufacturing decline, we have 1% or less interest rates, and that discourages these CEOs from making investments because it's easier to do financial engineering than to sit there and do the lean manufacturing to make the business competitive. It's cheaper to move it to Mexico. So let me take that as a question because I want to get more. But yeah. What's your reaction? Yeah. So, so I wrote this back to uh, the, the first to be slow down in America, right? I mean, we've seen since around 2004 the productivity growth slow in, in, in the United States and actually in advanced economies around the world. And it's deeply troubling because that's the basis for growth. There are multiple theories of why that's so. One of the key ones is exactly this, the financialization and, and all capitalization of major industries, which leads to people spending time, you know, companies spending time buying one another uh, and uh, buying back stock rather than investing in um, capital equipment and R&D. Um, it's at least one of the theories. There are other, other ones out there as well. Um, I, I think you put your, your finger on, on a key part, you know, a key problem. I don't have a great solution for it. Do you have one to offer? In case I didn't start there, so you'll have to forgive me. I, I always <laughs> back and, and, I may, and I may be the bad yeah. guy here because yeah. I want to get to other questions. We, we may just take a few more questions. Okay. Let's hear your... I'm okay. Okay, but I appreciate okay. that. But I want question to... is maybe you should go back to the Hamiltonian method of economy and put terror strap on to protect American interests <laughs> because they can't compete with Mexico Paying two bucks an hour. My train left the track on that. I was, I was <laughs> getting there. All right. So why don't you, why don't you come get it back? Go. Why don't you comment on that? So, um, boy, I, I, I've got to say, when you look at a candidate path to shared prosperity, one of them is to um, essentially try to reverse time, right? To tax the robots and put up trade barriers. Uh, I actually think that, that, that the toothpaste has left the tooth. The GD is out of the bottle on that. And if we don't find ways to be competitive in the global economy with appropriately open borders that protect our interests and make sure we're on a level playing field, I, I don't see a great future for the country. I just don't think that we can compete with that. Yes. So I think I'm right in your wheelhouse. I own a third generation family business and machine shop here in Dallas. Great. We have 15 employees. So my, my question is, or my observation is that our tax policy allows manufacturers and, and to go overseas. And so my question is, from a federal policy standpoint, we have a lot of smart people up there uh, to, to, to think through these things. So I think they're either scared, stupid, or afraid to make a mistake. Why would they do some of these things? Are again, you're saying behind closed doors. It's it's what we see in tech. I mean, it's yeah. what you see everywhere with politicians behind closed doors. They they talk it and make it, but when they come out, it's bam bam. No, can't do this. We can't do that. Yeah. So so uh, I urge you to read my quarter's report. Why political competition is failing America. Uh, he, he starts with the, the premise that um, you know, we say Washington's broken. Uh, he says actually it's not broken, it's producing exactly what it's designed to produce. Uh, and that the political system has been dominated by a uh, duopoly, two parties, who compete in ways that are, they're not rewarded for producing solutions. <clears throat> and so we should be surprised if they're not producing solutions. Um, the, and he actually, you know, he's got the five forces framework for analyzing industry um, structure. He applies it to the politics industry, and it's essentially it's a duopoly that's been in the business of raising barriers to entry for a generation or two. Um, he then goes on to offer some solutions, and I'm happy to go into those or or, or not. So we, I think we provide everyone here a link if you wanted to read this report. It's controversial, uh, but I'd recommend you read it, and, and you probably have it in front of you. So I'd say take some time if you want to to read this. 
And it, the only thing I'd say, Michael Porter has a lot of guts to take this on. Yeah. But it's a very, in the, it, as a leadership professor, you'd say there are deeply embedded design factors. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's not easy to change a system where there are deeply embedded design factors. Yeah. You will, so he's you, trying to do that. You will read the report and you will either be shaking your head or nodding your head. If your head is standing still, you should check your pulse. All right. So let, let's, take, let's take one right over here. Hello. Uh, I feel compelled to report a speak since I grew up poverty in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> and, uh, when I was when I got out of college, I'm an old guy, and I got out of college, Nixon had, had uh, just been elected, and I, uh, I spent some time working in municipal government first in Charlotte on on uh, HUD programs, and then. I worked in municipal government in Columbia, South Carolina, DOL programs. Um, and what you describe, your kind of your plan, really doesn't sound that much different than what people were doing in the 60s, 70s. I mean, it's still great society. Is this great society with lipstick on it? I mean, we spent trillions of dollars um, on all this stuff. I mean, more than the national debt, probably. So let's ask this. So let's ask the question. Yeah. The interesting thing about your proposals, it's not obvious to me that they take public money. Many of them. Some of no. them do, but many of them don't. Why don't you? Yeah. But your your fear is it's going to take a lot of public money. And why don't you talk? Yeah. Why don't you talk that through? So the local cross sector collaboration I'm talking about is largely not about huge expenditures of public funds. Um, in, in a sense, they are back to the future in the sense that I think we had deeply invested companies, locally invested companies in America historically, right? And a functioning local government, which together built a very productive companies. That was innovative. This companies. is where the term company town yeah. came from, right? The company played a major yeah, role. No, I, I, I think of more of a town based company. Right. Fair um, enough. You say company town, That's I think right. of, you know, a, a, But the point is, there's, a history, there's yeah. a history in this country right. where companies took great responsibility for the commons, so, is what I mean. So, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, Siemens in North Carolina, since you mentioned North Carolina, their energy business is based there. And they found they didn't have enough advanced manufacturing workers, which is, you know, um, what they needed. So they could have gone anywhere, because they are a global company. Instead, they doubled down. They partnered with Central Piedmont Community College. And the expenditures involved in what I'm about to describe to you were expenditures by Siemens. They got the uh, instructors from Central Piedmont Community College on the plane to go to Germany to figure out pre systems. They got them equipment in uh, the community college and state-of-the-art. They got the software that was state-of-the-art. Uh, and the benefits have gone back to Siemens, but also back to the surrounding community. I guess the, 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 the bet the company is making is the company cannot thrive in the long run if the community in which it is operating is wrong. Yeah. One more comment, Ed. Yes, sir. One could argue that all this special training that is, is being done in post secondary is nothing more than a band aid because the public school is there. And, and I don't think your, your, your plan of throwing more money at public schools, we already spent more on So, so we are talking about nothing, though. I never said throw more money at the public schools. And in fact, what we, we've, we've done a, a deep dive looking at the the roles that businesses can play in supporting educators to help students. Um, and it actually involves less money for businesses because, I mean, what we, even for the businesses, what the businesses have done historically is check with philanthropy. They've written out a check to ameliorate the bad outcomes of the weak system, but not actually change the system, right? What we see um, more progressive companies doing is investing to actually change the education system in partnership with educators. But it's not, so, so if, if money were the answer, the American public education system would be the best in the world, right? Yeah. So, and, and there's almost no correlation between the expenditures for students. So let's take another yeah. one right here. Another question, please. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, reform the higher education system? Uh, you know, I look at uh, my MBA uh, at Warren 30 years ago, it was 25,000. Now, a year, I'm sure, at Harvard is 125000 We pay administrators very handsome salaries. Uh, we pay college presidents like rock stars. And we have the same amount of students. 
So yeah. we talk about preparing the uh, educational system and how do we make education affordable for the middle class? Yeah, boy, it's, it's, it's a great question. I wish I wish I had an equally great answer. Uh, am I allowed to also have you, Sean Williams, or? <laughs> How much would support higher ed? We've actually not spent a lot of time looking at higher ed. Um, to, to my mind, there's at least one part of it that is uh, currently insane and needs to be addressed. And that is that in making selections of investments of education, students do this nearly data free, hmm. right? The student loan system, for instance, has essentially no price information in it, right? You would get a loan to go off and get a degree and sometimes get your job and sometimes not get your job and probably the same interest rate. Um, and, uh, and, and then the guidance system through the, the, the higher education system is terrible. It starts earlier, right? We've got 500 students from each guidance counselor in America in high schools. Uh, and then we send them off to, to school and typically, you know, we tell them, you know, study whatever your little heart desires, right? Yeah. Um, rather than saying here, you know, giving them good data. Um, you, you also address the cost structure of, of higher ed. And I think, you know, we'll see disruption in this. You know, technology enabled disruption is coming industry after industry. It's coming. I think it's coming for us as well. And I think that holds the hope of a much less costly and highly targeted education system where you're put on a pathway to prosperity rather than just told you must get a four-year degree because you got to get four-year degree. So on Jan's, just to chime in on Jan's point, so number one, we do a lot of work on this here. Our analysis is a lot of this, yes, you have a huge student debt over a trillion dollars, but if you graduate in six years or less, studies have shown you got a pretty good chance to service that debt. Half of all students in the United States are going to college and they're not graduating in six years. Okay, and I think that's a big part. If you don't graduate, good luck servicing the debt. The other thing is disruption. We we'll talk have a whole session on this. Disruption is coming to higher. We worked on it called yeah. HBX, mm -hmm. but there are increasingly online programs which are ubiquitous and sometimes even free, but modest costs are becoming better and better and better and better. And you're starting to see. I don't want to mention that certain state universities where enrollment is declining, MBA enrollment. Yeah. Depending on your is declining, and so uh, disruption is coming. This is an industry that's going to get radically restructured. I would guess in the next twenty years, it's already starting. And so, but the big worry in the meantime is if we continue to send half our students to college and they don't finish in six years, it, the, the economics don't work. And so we've got to improve early childhood <clears throat> literacy, secondary education, improve college readiness. Yeah. We've talked a lot about things to and we're going to retrain. I mean, the fact no, is, folks coming into, into the workforce today are going to have jobs that you and I can't even imagine. And they're not trained for them, no one is. Uh, we have the system to get there right now. The prevalence of chronic illness in the U.S. and the relatively high, the, the prevalence of chronic illness right. and the relatively high cost of healthcare. What kind of a role do you think that plays in U.S. competitiveness? And that's the exact same question. <laughs> well, let's take one. I'm just worried we've got a number of people waiting. Let's take this one because that's a big one. Yeah. So <laughs> when we look at the, the kind of strengths and weakness of America, the healthcare system is right there uh, as a key weakness. Uh, I want to be, you know, uh, careful in this kind of role. It's, it's easy to convince yourself that you're an expert in everything. And in healthcare, I certainly am not. Um, I, you know, the... Work that uh, it's done at HBS, I think, is best on this. Bob Kaplan, a different Bob Kaplan, different. The real Bob Kaplan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I sit, the I sit next to him. Okay. That really means the fact he always gets a big laugh out of yes. when I used to be like. Plus, yes. Yes. the email. Man. He must be getting his email. Oh my God! I grew that poor guy. I'm glad he has a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. I mean, they 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 have big pushing is what they call value based healthcare. Which means actually linking the costs and the value that we, the cost we spend and the value we, we obtain from healthcare, which is not at all what happens today. Um, we do have to get there. Um, next to the education system, it's probably the least tractable. Um, and, uh, you know, I defer to the experts in healthcare. 
So let's take one more over here. Uh, as an educator, and I, I came from a very poor background and depend on public schools to get out of it. So if you could name five things that you could do to our public education, or any education actually, to improve it, what would those be? Oh, man. Oh, that's great. So I, I'll, I'll tell you, my first, I'm not sure I'll get the fives, right? Um, my very first one is I would find some way to weaken the link between uh, the, the and this goes back to funding, which is not the, the, full, the full solution, but the resources available in public education and property taxes. Uh, right now, the that link means there's no hope of getting resources to where they're most needed. Um, and especially when it's in inequality and lack of opportunity. Because property taxes what funds public education. Yeah, it's the vast majority. So first of all, about 88% of funding uh, for education is local. Okay. And the vast majority of that is property, property, property taxes. So, you know, look. So you think it's underfunded as a result? But it's, it's unevenly funded. Unevenly funded. Uh, very so evenly funded. Depending on the wealth of the yeah. neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when my wife and I had kids, we wanted them to go to public schools. So what did we do? We went to the best suburb in, you know, outside Boston, where the property taxes are high and the schools are outstanding. Uh, but meanwhile, six miles away in Mattapan or Dorchester, the, you know, the funding is down there. The second thing, um, as far as I can tell, there's extraordinary expenditure and waste in public education, particularly at the central office level. A lot of it's not direct expenditure. Um, and I'd find ways to, to try to get the resources down to uh, where it's actually used. Um, I would uh, for sure engage businesses more deeply in giving kids a reason to graduate and to understand what's useful. I'll tell you just one example here uh, that I found inspiring. So Southwire Corporation uh, in rural Georgia, a um, maker of cable and wire, and their CEO realized he had a problem because he had committed only to hire high school graduates. But there weren't many people graduating from high school in Carroll County, Georgia. So they partnered with the school system, asked the schools to identify the students who were most at risk, and then built a dedicated factory that they staffed entirely by students that were at risk. Okay? And the deal was, if you go to school in the morning, you can work a shift for pay in the afternoon at Southwire. Okay? And it's managed by a combination of teachers and managers at Southwire. The results have been extraordinary. The graduation rate among these at-risk students is now above the system average. The graduation rate among the students at risk that are not in the program has gone up because their peers are graduating. The students who graduate go on to community colleges or four-year colleges or the military or to Southwire itself. The educators love it. They now go back to their other classes knowing what skills are actually needed in the workforce. The employees of Southwire adore the program because they know that it's meaningful, and it turns out that a productive, well-trained, well-managed high school student is about 40% more productive than a grown-up. <laughs> <laughs> so, the factory tax money to reinvest in the program. I think there are win-wins like that all over the place. Only got up to three. Yeah, uh, right. Jim Reed, Army Airborne yeah. veteran, uh, community development serial entrepreneur, and small business expert. Uh, my question is, how can we get a economic cultural shift in this country from unmitigated greed to a win-win strategy that recognizes to the extent that we pay, pay fair wages to the middle class, it increases our competitiveness and it uh, drives up consumer demand instead of, uh, you know, just how much is enough, okay? Yeah. In terms of uh, executive salaries and, re and returns to the top one percent, yeah. let's yeah. get a change. We need a change. <laughs> so we're going to be okay. political to make. So let's so let's take that. Uh, so so um, I feel like I, my my wife's uh, job. My wife's a psychiatrist. Her job is probably more appropriate for this one than mine is. <laughs> uh, in many ways, right? What drives drives people? Uh, so I push back a little bit on the thesis. I, I hear the thesis being that the dominant motivator of people in America is greed. Um, and for sure, I see that, and I see that in many that are I'm actually 
I don't know if that's the dominant ethos of America, in fact. Um, and particularly at the local level, I've been struck more by generosity than I have been by greed. Um, now, I will admit, I'm a silver lining guy, so it may just be me. Um, and I think, I, I, I think one question might be, how do we create a losing strategy? All right? Because maybe the issue is the incentives rather than the underlying. So, well, a little bit. So, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of changes in my lifetime uh, mm -hmm. in the financial sector. Uh, the role of uh, activist investors, uh, shorter time frames, the more institu the institutionalization of uh, shareholdings. Uh, yeah. And um, I think the most CEOs I know, and we spent a lot of time with CEOs, but like, want to build their company, want to help people, want to build their communities, but they're under a lot of pressure yeah. to deliver, and the CEO turnover in this country is going up. The tenure of the CEO in this country is much shorter. And so we're asking to balance externalities in the commons, and yet they've got somebody in the shock, uh, and they've yeah. got to deal with it. And I think this is, uh, this is, this is, this is, I don't have a brilliant answer, but I think it's getting worse, by the way. The yeah. pressures are getting worse, probably not better. But I think back to you and I both talk about leadership, I've taught leadership. Yeah. Uh, this is where, uh, the extent CEOs step up and the leaders of the country step up and leaders of the community step up and say, let's do this together. I, my experience, it's a bit unusual for me to find somebody who makes it a CEO, doesn't want to help the greater good, and really wants to do better. But I also sense that they're under a lot of pressures, many of them shareholders, and many of us say, why don't we do this? And then when we switch hats as shareholders, we say, my God, they cut the dividend, the stock is down 20%, and we don't realize we're doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so um, I think this this one probably needs more work yeah, to yeah, try to figure sure. It's a tough one. i got to say, I'm actually encouraged by what I see among my MBAs. Yes. I don't know if you have this. You know, no, they start off wanting to a very uh, aspiration. I think they actually have been so, so you know, I, I would say that, over the 20 years I've been with the HBS, they've, they've only gotten better in this regard. They're right. more concerned Much about more the, the, the impact you're going to have on society and the difference they're going to make in the world. Listen, so we used to talk at HBS, the biggest issue we face in this country is uh, is the externalities. Is people, leaders taking ownership of the externalities of the businesses or enterprises they're running. Yeah. It is the issue of our time and it's part of what your project and the way you define competitiveness is the comments. Is the comments is why it was an important thing to you. Let's take one or two more and then we're going to. That's the trend the in the business schools to make money and make meaning. Okay, yeah. fair enough. That's good. Yeah. Okay, let's hear. Let's hear let, I'm going to ask you to be brief because we're going to need to wrap this up. Okay, I understand. Uh, I, um, uh, we, we talked about the civic uh, end of it, but uh, I wanted to ask this question from the corporate side. Um, I, I own a multi-million dollar corporation that uh, uh, competes in the global market selling widgets and, and exporting. Um, my, but you found that I haven't lifted the standards for average Americans. Uh, what, what metrics did you use to judge me? What, and, and, uh, and what am I supposed to do about it? Yeah. Just, <coughs> so on the metrics side, you know, we look at mean household income over time and real terms, we look at job creation rates, we look at economic mobility measures. Um, and you know, there are, of course, firms that have done well in all of those. Um, but when you look at the aggregate, and, and what's interesting is not just since the Great Recession, it goes back somewhere around 1999, 2000, it's going to be a turn in all of those measures. Um, you know, in the ways we would not want to um, to see. And then, what do you do about it? You know, as a business leader, I think there are basically three responsibilities um, and roles. The first would be, to, and I'm sure you do this already, run your company for profitability and productivity, right? And probably the greatest contribution most business students make to U.S. competitiveness is they run the companies really well, right? The second one is a do no harm pledge, which applies much more to, to big businesses. Don't mess up the commons as you try to pursue your narrow self-interest. My favorite example is the tax code. Like, how did we get a convoluted corporate tax code? It wasn't because some of the IRS woke up one morning and said, I know we need more loopholes. <laughs> it's because companies have been very successful pursuing their self-interest to get their special approval. And the final one is to seek out opportunities and build a business and build the commons at the same time. 
Southwire is better because they invest in the commons. And I think there are multiple opportunities. Uh, and there are opportunities that we, certainly one of the things we're trying to do is spread it good examples. We find the examples, these local examples, stay bottled up in individual cities. Um, so, you know, on our website, for instance, you'll see cases on examples of companies that found innovative ways to create shared prosperity. All right, so let's, and I apologize to you, sir, because we have to wrap this up. Uh, and we promised we'd end this around seven-ish. If you had, even, how many of you would like to get more involved in your communities to help build the commons? Okay. God bless you all. So you won them over on that. What if you had, well, they came in this way. It, it's, it's probably good, actually. But well, he said it didn't do too much harm. But if you had to give one or most people that talk here say, great, I'm in, what should I do? Yeah. If you had to, and you talk about cross collaboration, not so easy, what's one or two pieces of advice, specific actions that people in this room could take if they're interested in doing more? Yeah, so, so the, the first one is get engaged, right? The very first thing is pick a part of the commons that you care about that is important for your business. And find a way to make real this notion that your company going to thrive if the company's if the community thrives. So, as well. so that could be getting involved in local schools. It can be in local schools. Early childhood literacy. Early childhood literacy. It can be a nonprofit. It can be in a backbone organization that kind of looks out for a set of these, these okay. things. Um, but you know, get get the game. The other is as you do that um, for business leaders in particular. There's, there's a different style of leadership involved in cross-sector collaboration. It's leadership where no one's in charge. And in fact, there's even a, a paradox here. A lot of the things that get people successful in private sector organizations and rise to the top are exactly the behaviors that don't do well in cross-sector collaboration, right? You rise through higher organization, you're used to having someone in charge or being in charge, and now you're in a different context, and, and you got to you got to retrofit your leadership style. Okay. So uh, let me just say in closing, that, and mm -hmm. we say this a lot, the problems in the next 25 years are, are not going to be solved by somebody else, and they're probably not going to be able to be solved by the government because the government is very highly leveraged. Probably going to be solved by people in this room, by us. And to the extent each of us finds a way to get involved, I think the world is going to be a much better place. And I want to thank Jan, the work you've done. Thank you. With thank you.